This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm Ron Hendel. I'm uh, the Norma and Sam Dabby Professor of Hebrew Bible and Jewish Studies uh, at Cal, and I'm a member of the Forrester Lecture Committee. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you here today. We are pleased, along with the Graduate Council, to present Jan Asman, this year's speaker in the Forrester Lecture Series. The series is dedicated to an exploration of the immortality of the soul and other kindred subjects. Among the many uh, distinguished past lecturers in this series, and you can see the impressive list of names in the back of your program, Professor Osman will actually address the main topic that the lecture series is in theory dedicated to. That is to say the immortality of the soul rather than other kindred subjects. As a condition of this bequest, we're obligated to tell you how the endowment supporting the Forrester Lectures on the Immortality of the Soul uh, came to be at UC Berkeley. Uh, in 1928, Edith uh, Zweibruck, a public school teacher in San Francisco, established the Forrester Lectureship to honor the memory of her sister, Agnes Forrester, and her husband, Constantine Forrester. Uh, he was a lawyer and partner of Alexander Morrison, who was one of the uh, most prominent attorneys in San Francisco and the man for whom our uh, Morrison Memorial Library is named. In her last days, Edith Zweibruck expressed her deep and abiding interest in spiritual life by creating this lecture series on the subject, the immortality of the soul and kindred subjects. Now I turn to our distinguished lecturer, Jan Asman is a name to conjure with in both Egyptology and in the wider humanities. A longtime professor of Egyptology at the University of Heidelberg and currently an uh, honorary professor at the University of Constance, Asman is a master of philological and historical detail who has the rare talent of synthesis, of being able to situate the details into a sophisticated scheme of culture, history, and philosophy. He has transcended the field of Egyptology in his pioneering work in the field of cultural memory and in the history of religious transformations in Western culture. He has written dozens of books uh, many of which have been translated into other languages. A selection of my personal favorites, which uh, adorn my bookcase at home, are Egyptian Solar Religion in the New Kingdom, Ray Amun and the Crisis of Polytheism, The Search for God in Ancient Egypt, The Mind of Egypt, History and Meaning in the Time of the Pharaohs, his classic, Moses the Egyptian, The Memory of Egypt in Western Monotheism. Another classic, Cultural Memory and Early Civilization, Writing, Remembrance, and Political Imagination. Various collections of essays, including Religion and Cultural Memory. Recently, uh, a, a book called Religio Duplex, How the Enlightenment Reinvented Egyptian Religion, and many, many more. He has also written, recently written books on Thomas Mann, Mozart, Hendel, and I must say not this Hendel, but Uncle George Friedrich Hendel, uh, and the Book of Exodus. And the, um, happily, the Book of Exodus is now being translated, uh, his, his uh, book on Exodus is now being translated into English. I must confess that Asman is one of my personal intellectual heroes whose work has inspired me 
and taught me how to think about ancient religion, cultural memory, and other complicated subjects. Many other scholars of my generation owe him a similar debt. It has been a great pleasure to host him at Berkeley this week. Since the founding of this lecture series in 1928, the Forrester Lectures has been delivered by such distinguished individuals as Paul Tillich, Aldous Huxley, and Oliver Sacks. This evening, Jan Asman will join that list with a lecture on immortality and Egyptian dream. Please join me in welcoming Jan Asman. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I am extremely happy to be here, extremely grateful to the Forster Committee for this invitation and to Ron Handel for his very kind and warm introduction and also to Ron and to Alan Gobler for making my stay in Berkeley so extremely <clears throat> uh, pleasant. Well, um, immortality and Egyptian dream. Immortality was the Egyptian dream. In the same way as the rise from rags to riches is or was the American dream. The ancient Egyptians formed very early a strong idea of immortality. And my contention is that this concept exerted in the course of time an enormous influence on the other civilizations of the Eastern Mediterranean world. Immortality is a concept that involves at least three dimensions. Time and space, it is obvious that immortality takes place in another sphere. Time, it obviously implies the concept of eternity. And the social dimension. It, <clears throat> um, immortality is obviously not for everybody, but for heroes, emperors, artists of outstanding achievements. Let's start with space. Virtually all the religions of the ancient world around the Mediterranean and in the Near East lived in a tripartite world, comprising the realms of the gods, the living, and the dead. In this respect, Egypt made no exception. Heaven or some other remote sphere for the gods, the upper world for the living, and the nether world for the dead. The realm of the dead is the place where human beings continue their existence after having lived in the upper world. They do not live on in this realm, but are dead. Being dead, however, does not mean to disappear from this world altogether, but to pass from the realm of the living to the realm of the dead. There was no way back to life once the passage from life to death has been performed, nor was there the possibility of a second passage from the realm of the dead to the world of the gods. Exceptions such as Orpheus' attempt to restore Eurydice to life in the upper world or to receive heroes such as Hercules after death in the divine world only confirm the rule by their very exceptionality. The exception that ancient Egypt did make in the context of these religions consisted in the introduction of a space within the divine world that under certain conditions was also accessible for human beings. Besides the world of the living and the world of the dead, they recognized an Elysian sphere for which there are many names and descriptions in Egyptian texts, such as field of rushes, field of offerings, Bark of Millions, House of Osiris, and so on. And this ternary distinction between A, the world of the living, B, the world of the dead, and C, the Elysian world, is reflected by the distinction of three classes of beings. <clears throat> Remechu, humans, Mutu, the dead, and Ahu, transfigured spirits. 
Nechiru, gods, constitute a fourth class, sharing the divine world with the Ahu. And this distinction between the realm of the dead and the illusion sphere, or Mutu, the dead, and Ahu, transfigured spirits, marks, in my opinion, the exceptional structure of ancient Egyptian religion and its concept of immortality. Now to the dimension of time. The ancient Egyptian concepts of time were determined by two central phenomena, the daily course of the sun and the annual cycles of the inundation of the Nile and the vegetation. In the Egyptian imagination, both refer to a transcendent sphere, the heaven in the case of the sun and the netherworld in the case of the Nile. And these two spheres are dominated and represented by two gods, Re, the sun god, and Osiris, the god of the netherworld. Re and Osiris stand also for two aspects of time or eternity. Nechech, the time of endless repetition and regeneration, is represented by Re, the sun god especially in his mourning form of Chepre. And yet, the time of endless duration and continuation is represented by Osiris, the lord of the netherworld and of the dead, especially in his cognomen as Vanafre, he who endures in perfection. The two aspects of time refer to the aspect system of the Egyptian language. Nechech, left, on the left side is time in its imperfective aspect as an ongoing process. Jet, on the right, is time in its perfective aspect as an accomplished process whose final result is unchangeably and forever enduring. Nechech is time as visualized and symbolized by the celestial bodies and their cyclical movements especially the sun, whose hieroglyph serves as a determinative or classifier of the world, which you see <clears throat> on your left, the sun between these two H's. And jet is visualized and symbolized by the stone. And the word is written with the sign of the earth as a classifier. And these two words complement each other to form the encompassing concept both of time and of eternity. They serve as both denotations and negations <coughs> of time. They negate time as transience by denoting the endlessness of repetition and duration. The ancient Egyptian ideas and hopes of immortality are directed towards these two aspects of endlessness, endless regeneration in Nechech and endless duration in Jet. The third dimension is implied in the concept of immortality is the social dimension. Who is granted immortality? In the third millennium, the Old Kingdom, this was the privilege of the king. The dead king transforms himself into Osiris and partakes of endless duration in the subterranean chambers of his monumental pyramid, and he ascends to heaven and unites with the sun god by means of the same pyramid, which is pointing towards heaven and oriented to the cardinal points. Normal mortals, by contrast, are buried in mastaba tombs. And instead of ascending to heaven, they dwell in their tombs and descend to the realm of the dead, the domain of Osiris. Humans hide, but gods fly up, we read in the spell of the pyramid text. The king, being a god, flies to heaven. The humans hide in their tombs and descend to the realm of Osiris. Their hopes of an afterlife are based on duration and its medium, the stone. And so far as they have access to building craft and stone masonry, which is a monopoly of the state, 
They built themselves monumental tombs in which they can both hide and communicate with the world of the living. Their mummy rests in the inaccessible burial chamber and the accessible parts of the tomb accommodate the cult and <clears throat> the inscriptions in which the tomb owner communicates with, uh, with um, <clears throat> the living, the uh, later generations. He or she inhabits the tomb and communicates with the living in the form of his or her car, an invisible double who is able to cross the false door, <coughs> separating and linking the two spheres of the visible and the invisible, the accessible and the inaccessible, in order to animate his representations, receive the offerings, and protect the tomb. Also, the king has a car, being the son of the sun god and of his bi biological father, who after death has become Osiris. But in addition to his car, he also has a bar, in the form of which he is able to fly up to heaven and to move freely in the spheres of heaven, earth, and underworld. The immortalization of the king, however, was not conceived as an automatic process, but as the result of a very elaborate set of spells and rituals, of which we are extremely well informed through the pyramid texts, the oldest corpus of religious literature in the history of mankind. With the last king of the fifth dynasty, Unas, the Egyptians started to inscribe the burial chambers of the pyramids with hundreds of ritual texts. And these rituals were called Zeahu, literally turning the dead into an Ach, a transfigured spirit, and consisted mainly of recitations describing the king's ascent to heaven, his reception by the gods, and his union with the sun god, his father. They also comprised of a sequence of spells where Ra plays no role, and which center on the myth of Osiris. And these were perhaps performed by night and were closely related to the last act of mummification, the encoffinment. The myth of Osiris provided the model of the passage from death to immortality. This myth went like this. Osiris, a god and a king of Egypt, has been killed by his brother and rival Seth, who moreover tore his body apart and scattered his limbs all over Egypt. Isis, the sister and wife of Osiris, traversed Egypt in search of the membra desiecta of her brother, reassembling them into the shape of a body. Together with her sister Nephthys, she bewails the body in long songs of lamentation, using the power of speech as a means of reanimation and was so successful that she was able to receive a child from the reanimated body of Osiris. And this is the first step towards restitution and transformation. The appearance of Horus, the son and heir of Osiris, marks the second scene of the myth and initiates the second phase of transformative restitution. In the same way as Isis and Nephthys are occupied with restoring the body, Horus is occupied with restoring the social personality of Osiris. We meet here with a very pronounced gender differentiation. The restoration of the body is a female preoccupation. The means which come to bear in this respect are lamentation, mourning, effective language, expressions of desire and longing. Everything in this female part of the ritual aims at recollecting the scattered limbs and restoring the dis dismembered body. Female mourning is concentrated on the bodily sphere of the dead. 
The restoration of the social sphere of the dead, on the other hand, the status, dignity, honor, and prestige, is constructed as a male preoccupation and the task of the son. Bodily restoration overcomes the dismemberment of the body. Social restoration overcomes the isolation and dishonor of the victim and turns it into a situation of higher status, general recognition, honor, prestige, respect, and majesty. The efforts of Hordos culminate in his success of bringing Seth, the murderer, to court, where he will be declared guilty and Osiris justified. And this is the decisive step by which Osiris, the dead, is separated from death personified in Seth, and restore the life through justification. Justified, ma'acheru, becomes the term for what in Jewish and Christian tradition is expressed by <coughs> words, by phrases like of blessed memory and the like. And this form of decomposing the complex experience of death seems to me one of the particular achievements of the myth mythical modeling of reality by personifying death in the figure of Seth. That is made treatable. It can be brought to court, accused and condemned. The justice which has been violated by the murder committed by Seth can be restored in the view of this mythology. There is no, there is no natural death. Every death is a crime that must be vindicated, and the ritual treatment of death culminates in the enactment of this vindication. There is guilt behind every death, and this guilt has to be removed in order to restore the deceased to status and position in society. Every death is murder and injustice. Therefore, it can be healed in a way by punishing the murderer and restoring justice. Osiris has defeated Seth, which means that he has vanquished death. He cannot be restored to life upon earth, but he is given eternal life in the other world. He is reintegrated into cosmic existence. The mythical Osiris was made ruler of the netherworld and king of the dead. The dead king follows his example. He is called Osiris and takes place on his throne in order to rule the dead and the spirits, while his son Horus takes place on his former throne among the living. The term justification is an unmistakable Christian Pauline ring. I do not think this is a mere coincidence. One could go even further and use the term resurrection for this concept of transformative restoration because the dead king is constantly summoned to rise. Raise yourself, watches you. It's a typical address to the deceased and it means not only to get up but to ascend to heaven. And this is the meaning of resurrection in the old kingdom. It is the exclusive privilege of the pharaoh. The myth of Osiris is, at least as far as its core meaning is concerned, not about the cycles of nature, the seed that is buried in order to sprout again, the waxing and waning moon, the rising and the falling inundation, but about kingship. Osiris is a king in the first place. The lawsuit with Seth is about the throne of Egypt. The myth of Osiris is first of all about rulership, in the second place about death and resurrection, and only in a rather peripheral and associative way about nature and cyclical time. It is the Egyptian myth of the state. In the pyramid text of the Old Kingdom, the roles of Osiris and Horus are played by the deceased king and his successor. This constellation of father and son, one in the hereafter, one in the world of the living, is one of the most fundamental elements of ancient Egyptian culture. 
The funerary cult is based on the idea that only the sun is capable of reaching into the world of the dead and of entering a constellation with his dead father that bridges the threshold of death and that is mutually supportive and life-giving. And this is what is meant by the Egyptian word ach. A widespread sentence says, ach is a father for his son, ach is a son for his father. And this originally mortuary constellation provides the model not only for the mortuary cult, but for cult in general. Pharaoh, the only living being on earth capable of entering into communication with the divine world, approaches the gods as their son. In cult, he plays the role of the living son vis-a-vis -vis his dead fathers and mothers. Filial piety is the basic religious attitude towards the god. And this is also the point where the royal car comes into play. The car is the principle of dynastic and genealogical con continuity uniting fathers and sons and running through the sequence of generations. The Ba forms a pair with the body and may be termed the corporeal soul. The Ka supports the constellation of dead father and surviving son and may be termed the social soul. Its symbol and hieroglyph is a pair of arms that reach out, not upwards in adoration, but horizontally in an embrace. The sign symbolizes the mystic embrace that unites a deceased father and a surviving son. Every human being has a car, also the king being the son of the sun god and of his biological father, who after death has become Osiris. But in addition to his car, he also, also has a bar. And there is thus a very marked difference between the royal form of afterlife, which is one of divine immortality in the heavenly sphere, and the afterlife of normal mortals who go down to the realm of Osiris and stay in their tombs on earth, communicating with posterity by means of the inscriptions and the mortuary cult. The distanciation of the royal hereafter from the destiny of non-royal beings forms the central theme of the pyramid text. The Elysium, therefore, was originally a political concept. It surpassed the world of the dead in the same way as the figure of the pharaoh surpassed the world of the living. In order to understand this categorical distinction in the social dimension between kings and mortals, it is important to realize that the pharaonic state, as it emerged around 3000 BCE, out of a group of rivaling chiefdoms, was the first big territorial state in human history, stretching from the shore of the Mediterranean to the first cataract. Mesopotamia as a political organization is as old as Egypt, perhaps even older. It did, however, not constitute a big territorial state in the way Egypt did, but took the form of a network of competitive and cooperative city-states. Accordingly, in Egypt, the position of the ruler was immensely more elevated above the sphere of his subjects than in Mesopotamia. And since the early states were first of all sacred institutions, whose most important task was to establish a contact with the divine world, the Egyptians went so far as to see in their, in their king a god on earth, and even the incarnation of the highest god, the sun god. He wore the title Horus, and Horus at that time, and until latest, latest time at the place of his old sanctuary in Edfu, the prehistoric capital from where the process of unifi unification started, was worshipped as a sun god. Horus is a falcon, thus associated with the sky, 
on the one hand, and with a predatory, aggressive character of swift violence on the other hand. The name means the far one, derived from a verb heri, to be far, written with a sign for heaven or sky. The earliest representation of Horus, dating from the time of unification, shows him as a falcon in a boat sailing over the sky, represented by a pair of wings. Above another falcon, sitting on the palace facade, the Zerech, that encloses the name of the king, Ser Serpent. While the lower falcon functions as a royal title and represents the king, the upper falcon can only refer to the sun. The whole is a remarkable visualization of the Egyptian idea of kingship as the terrestrial representation of solar power and cosmogonic energy. Horus, the far one, expresses distance not only in the spatial, but also in the social sense, meaning superiority, lordship, and this is the obvious meaning of the name as a royal title. An iconic representation of Horus as sun god shows him as a sun disk with wings. And this icon became from a certain time, third dynasty, about 2750 onwards, the official heraldic emblem or coat of arms, so to speak, of pharaonic Egypt. It was later taken over by Assyria and Persia and might have inspired other ornithomorphic imperial emblems, such as the eagles and double eagles of Rome and its successors in Germany, Austria, Russia, and the USA. At the time when Horus was chosen as the royal title, this god was without any doubt worshipped as the highest god of the Egyptian pantheon, both as a god of the sun and as a god of the state. In all stages of Egyptian history, the roles of sun god and state god went together and were always played by the highest god of Egypt. It is thus the name of the highest god that served as a title for the king, who was thereby identified with this god as his terrestrial incarnation or deputy or avatar. With the end of the third millennium and the collapse of the old kingdom, the text that had codified the royal ideas about the celestial afterlife in the world of the gods, became accessible to the literate elite, at least to its most prominent members. We cannot tell how far these beliefs and ideas penetrated downwards in the larger parts of Egyptian society. Our notions of the Egyptian beliefs are based on texts and monuments, and the generalizability of these observations remains an open question. The concept of Ba, however, became anthropologized, that is believed to be the property of every human being. Now everybody, and again we cannot tell whether everybody means every member of a certain elite or every Egyptian, saw him or herself presented with two ways to save him or her from vanishing and perishing the way of terrestrial, monumental duration, and the way of celestial immortality. The criterion for reaching immortality, however, had to be redefined. It could no longer be a question of royalty or non-royalty, and became redefined as a question of morality, that is, of good and bad in a moral sense. Not the divine quality of royal office, but the virtue and justice of a deceased person were now believed to be the conditions and prerequisitions of resurrection and immortality. Therefore, the lawsuit and the idea of justification changed their meaning in a very fundamental way. The dead had no longer to be justified against death as a murderer, but before a divine tribunal. And the guilt which is inherent in death is no longer externalized 
in form of a scapegoat, Seth, but is interpreted as the deceased's own guilt, which he has accumulated during his life on Earth. The earliest texts deal with the concept of justification in the closest possible association with ideas related to embalmment and mummification. Guilt, accusation, enmity, and so on are treated as forms of impurity and pollution, as immaterial pollutants, as it were, that must be eliminated in order to bring the deceased into a state of purity that resists putrefaction and decomposition. Justification is moral mummification. When the embalmer's work on the body is finished, the priests take over and extend the work of purification and preservation onto the whole person. The Egyptian word for mummy also means dignity or nobility. At the last stage of mummification, the deceased passes through the post-mortem judgment and is assigned the nobility of a follower of Osiris in the netherworld. He is justified against all accusations and purified from every guilt, every sin that might have obstructed his passage into the other world, even from the solecisms of early childhood. After the cleansing and immortalization of the body, the embalmment and mummification ritual turns in its last stage to the social self. The judgment is nothing other but a purging of the soul from guilt. The idea of a general judgment post-mortem develops during the Middle Kingdom at the beginning of the second millennium BC. It is clearly expressed in a wisdom text dating from that time. The court that judge the wretch, you know they are not lenient on the day of judging the miserable in the hour of doing their task. It is painful when the accuser has knowledge. Do not trust in the length of years. They view lifetime in an hour. When a man remains over after death, his deeds are set beside him as a sum. Being yonder lasts forever. A fool is he who does not, who does what they reprove. He who reaches them without having done wrong, wrong will exist there like a god, free striding like the lords of eternity. This is what immortality means in the context of ancient Egyptian funerary beliefs, to exist in an Elysium hereafter like a god, free striding like the lords of eternity. With the rise of the new kingdom and the recension of the Book of the Dead, the rules of admission into the other world had become codified and formed the 125th chapter of the Book of the Dead. The mythical model of a lawsuit between Osiris and Seth has disappeared altogether. The whole procedure resembled now more an examination and an initiation. The deceased had to present himself before Osiris, the president of the court, and before a jury of 42 judges. He knew the accusations beforehand and had to declare his innocence. All of the possible crimes and violations which could constitute an obstacle for passing the exam had been spelled out and laid down in two lists, one of 40 and the other of 42 entries. The deceased had, had to recite these lists and explicitly to declare his or her innocence in each individual item. During this recital, the heart of the candidate was weighed on a balance against a figure of truth. Every lie would make sink the scale with the heart a little deeper. In case of a heart being found too heavy and irredeemably charged with guilt and lies, a monster, which is always shown close to the balance and watching the weighing, would swallow the heart of the sinner and annihilate his, annihilate his or her person. By reciting these lists of negations, I did not do this, I did not do that, the deceased purged himself from all possible charges 
that could constitute immaterial pollutants causing his final destruction. He thus entered the other world in a state of imperishable purity. The spell in the Book of the Dead is entitled Purging a, <clears throat> a Person of All the Evil Which He Has Done and Beholding the Faces of the Gods. Again, there's no question of innocence. Nobody is innocent. What matters is whether a person is able or not to get purged of his or her sins. In the title of chapter 125, the ideas of moral purity and immediate vision of the gods are brought into close relationship. According to Egyptian convictions, nobody, except perhaps the king, was able during lifetime to see the gods, to have a vision and to enter the divine world in a trance or meditation or so. There are no traces of shamanism, prophetism, or mysticism in Egypt before the Greco-Roman period. All forms of immediate contact with the divine world are referred to the life after death and resurrection. All the gods you have served on earth, you will confront face to face. We read in a Harper's song in one of these tombs. From this text and countlessly others, we learn that the Egyptian Elysium was the same as the world of the gods. The dead who proved worthy of being justified before the divine tribunal was admitted into the divine world and was permitted to confront the gods face to face. The world of the gods did not form a fourth realm besides the other three, but contains the Elysium. The Egyptian cosmology, therefore, showed the same tripartite structure as all the other cosmologies of the ancient world, heaven, earth, and underworld, or world of the gods, world of the living, and world of the dead. With the one exception, that the dead were believed to be capable of managing the passage from the world of the dead to the world of the gods if they proved innocent or at least justifiable in the judgment of the dead. For our categories of logical thinking, the two forms of surviving death, the monumental way of lithic duration and the moral way of justification and immortality would exclude each other. Why build an expensive monumental tomb and provide for the even more expensive mortuary cult if one passes into transcendent realms to live among the gods. <clears throat> Free striding like the lords of eternity. For the Egyptians, however, the two concepts of afterlife complement each other. Even after adopting the ideas of justification, elysium, and immortality, they continued to mummify their corpses, build monumental tombs, and establish a cult as an interface with the world of the living, a place of worship, sacrificial communication, and autobiographical self-representation. Building a tomb remained the most important life project. In the teaching of Hor-Jedef, that dates perhaps back to the Old Kingdom, we read the exhortation to build oneself a tomb and to magnificently equip one's home of eternity. Here it is also stressed that one should build one's tomb not only for oneself, but above all for one's son, who is to perform the mortuary cult, to take one's place in the world of the living and to bridge the gap that divides the two worlds of here and there. So, build a house for your son, then a place will be created for you in which you will be. Richly equip your house in the realm of the dead and effectively outfit your place in the rest. In the instruction for Mary Carré, the ancient maxim of Hordjerev became modernized, that, that is moralized, as follows, and this is perhaps 400 years later. They will need richly equip your house in the realm of the dead and effectively outfit your place in the West. This is a quotation from the teaching of, 
of Hort Jedef, but now it continues by being upright, by doing justice, upon which man's heart may rely. A tomb is not built by stone alone, but by being upright and doing justice. The monumental tomb is but the visual sign of a good that is justifiable life. The secret of redemption from vanishing and perishing is Ma'at, the Egyptian goddess and personification of justice, order, and truthfulness. In the tale of the eloquent peasant, it is said that Ma'a takes him who practiced her in his life by the hand and accompanies him to the necropolis. Justice is for eternity. It enters the graveyard with its, with its doer. When he is buried and earth enfolds him, his name does not pass from the earth. He is remembered because of his goodness. That is the rule of the God's command. When Hecateus of Abdera, 1,500 years later, visited Egypt and interrogated the inhabitants about the meaning of their sumptuous tomb architecture, he found the same principles still alive. So he writes, and this is at the end of the fourth century BC, the Egyptians regard the time spent in this life as completely worthless. But to remember for virtue after one's death, they hold to be of highest value. Indeed, they refer to the houses of the living as inns, cataluses, since we dwell in them but a short time, while the tombs of the dead they call everlasting houses, are idioi oikoi, since in Hades we remain for an endless span. For this reason, they trouble themselves little about the furnishings of their houses, but betray an excess of ostentation concerning their places of burial. Virtue, neferu in Egyptian, meaning perfection, refers to living according to the rules of Ma'at. And this is what ensures endless remembrance and endless duration in one's house of eternity. The vizier Amun Uza, who lived in the first half of the 15th century, avowed the same principles in one of his inscriptions, again quoting and modifying the classical maxim of Hort Jedef. I built for me an excellent tomb in my city of eternity. I equipped magnificently the place of my rock tomb in the cliffs of everlastingness. My name May my name endure upon it in the mouth of the living, my memory being perfect with people after the years to come. Just a trifle is a lifespan spent on earth, but eternity is spent in the netherworld. God praises the noble one who acts for himself with regard to the future, who seeks with his heart to find for himself what is wholesome, namely burying his corpse and making his name live and who considers eternity. We see that the old idea, ideal of an afterlife in and by means of a monumental tomb that serves not only as a hiding place of the mummy, but above all, of a place of ongoing communication with the living, and the new ideal of passing the judgment of the dead and being admitted to the illusion of the field of reeds or rushes exist side by side. From the beginning of the second millennium on, moreover, the tomb is seen not only as a place of cult, but also as a door to the upper world, where the dead, by crossing the false door, may go up and see the sun. And this idea of going forth by day becomes, in the course of the second millennium, the most important goal of all the various preparations for surviving death. The idea of immortality, immortality through justification, formed the center of Egyptian beliefs and the strong parallels to Christian ideas of salvation and justification cannot be more mere coincidence. Belief, however, engenders disbelief. 
And I think that to be the most astonishing aspect of the Egyptian idea of immortality, that they even managed to give disbelief a voice. One of these voices is a literary text that casts serious doubts on the sense of tomb building and mortuary cult. The famous dialogue between a man and his bar, dating from about the same time as the teaching for Mary Carré, the Middle Kingdom. Both interlocutors, the man and his bar, agree in their longing for death. The man, however, wants to postpone death until a tomb has been built and a survivor has been appointed to perform the funerary and mortuary rituals. Whereas the bar pleads for an immediate departure from, his, from this world, doubting the sense of cult and tomb building. If you think of burial, it is heartbreak. It is bringing tears by saddening a man. It is taking a man from his house, casting him in the desert. You will not go up to see the sun. Those who build in granite, who erected halls and excellent tombs of excellent construction, when the builders have become gods, their offering stones are desolate, like the inert who have died on the riverbank for lack of a survivor. Follow the feast day, forget worry. Another text dating presumably from the same time of transition around 2000 BCE casts doubts not on tomb building in this world, but on life conditions in the other world. And this text too, too is a dialogue. In consequence of some catastrophic events that are not made clear, presumably the murder of Osiris by his brother Seth, Atum, the creator, assigns Osiris to the netherworld where is to reign as lord of the dead. Osiris, however, <clears throat> does not view this realm as an illusion. <clears throat> o Atom, how is it that I must travel to the wasteland of the realm of the dead? It has no water, it has no air, it is utterly deep, dark, and endless. And Atom responds, you live there in contentment of heart, but there is no making love there. Adam, I have granted transfiguration in place of water, air, and making love, and contentment of heart in the place of bread and beer. There is no mention of redemption from death and of reaching an illusion sphere where Osiris will rule and find eternal satisfaction of his wishes and desires. Instead, Adam says that he will transform these very desires so that Osiris will no longer yearn for water, air, bread, beer, and sexual pleasure. He has replaced desires with contentment of heart and human nature with transfiguration. This answer, however, stays in stark contrast to all the descriptions and depictions of the Elysian sphere to which the Egyptians hoped to be assigned after their justification before the divine tribunal and must therefore be counted as an expression of disbelief. In this text, the interlocutors are gods and there's, there's no mention of the human sphere. It is about the difference between the divine sphere and the realm of the dead that Osiris is assigned to. The other dialogue between a man and a spy about life on earth and in the beyond, <clears throat> in, uh, <clears throat> so the other is, is about uh, the human condition in this world. And in the last line, the bar quotes from banquet songs whose message is equally skeptical concerning the hereafter. So this exhortation of making marriage, uh, celebrate the feast and make merry. And uh, so this is a quotation from banquet songs. The most famous of these songs occurs in a tomb inscription accompanying the figure of a blind harper and dating from the Amarna, post-Amarna period. It also appears interspersed among love songs in the somewhat later papyrus. And it reads like follows. How happy is this good prince, the beautiful fate has come. 
a generation passes, another stays since the time of the ancestors. The gods who were before rest in their tombs. Their places are gone. What has become of them? I have heard the word of Imhotep and Hor Jedef, whose sayings are recited everywhere. What of their places? Their walls have crumbled. Their places are gone, as though they had never been. None comes from there to tell of their state, to tell of their needs to calm our heart until we go where they have gone. Hence rejoice in your heart. Forgetfulness befits you. Follow your heart as long as you live. Put mill on your head, dress in fine linen, anoint yourself with oils fit for a god. Heap up your joys, let your heart not sink. Follow your heart and your happiness. Do your things on earth as your heart commands. When there comes to you that day of mourning, the very hearted, this is Osiris, he is not their mourning. Wailing saves no man from the pit. Make holiday, do not vary of it. Lo, none is allowed to take his goods with him. Lo, none who departs comes back again. What the skeptic harpers proclaim belongs to the semantic of the feast. That being a typical heterotope forms an independent universe of meaning within the broader context of general culture. We meet with the same exhortations to remember death, realize the shortness of life, and grasp the present festive moment with all the tensity of awareness and enjoyment in the epic of Gilgamesh. And there it is the divine innkeeper Siduri who greets Gilgamesh with these words, Gilgamesh, whither are you wandering? Life which you look for, you will never find. For when the gods created man, they let death be his share, and life withheld in their own hands. Gilgamesh, fill your belly, day and night make merry, let days be full of joy, dance and make music day and night, and wear fresh clothes, and wash your head and bathe. Look at the child that is holding your hand, and let your wife delight in your embers. These things alone are the concern of men. Gilgamesh, in his search of immortality, has reached the end of the world. Siduri tells him that immortality is not man's lot, but mortality, and that he should make his short stay on earth as joyful and lively as possible. Men should not spoil the precious moment of earthly existence by worrying about an imaginary hereafter. The relation of this wisdom to the feast is given by the fact that Siduri is an innkeeper pouring wine to the gods. Banquet songs fall into her competency. Even in the Bible, we, we meet with this skeptical view of afterlife and immortality. In chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes, we read, Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already approved what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life, and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for in the realm of the dead where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. There is even a relation of this text to the genre of banquet songs, because the book of Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, is read during the feast of Sukkot, that is spent in booths of branches with much singing and wine drinking. Besides the feast and literature, however, there is still a third place where voice is given to doubt and disbelief. And this is the dirge, the ritual lamentation of the surviving widow. I quote only one example of this genre. The house of those in the West is deep and dark. 
There is no door, no window in it, no light to brighten, no north wind to refresh the heart. The sun does not rise there. They lie forever in sleep because of the darkness, even in the daytime. Oh, woe, may the dear one be safe and sound, breathing air. Or another text, the one with the booming voice is silent. He does not speak. The self-aware, the self-aware one is unconscious. Those in the West are in difficulty. Their condition is bad. How motionless is the one who has gone to them? He cannot describe his condition. He rests in his lonely place, and eternity is with him in darkness. There is one very late text, and this will be my last example, dating from the first century BCE. It is a stela that the high priest of Tach set up for his deceased wife, or which he she herself had set up when she, when she was still alive, in which she addresses her surviving husband. Oh, my brother, my husband, my friend, high priest, your heart will not weary of drinking and eating, of intoxication and lovemaking. Spend a good day, follow your heart day and night. Let no care enter in, into your heart. What are years not spent on earth? The rest, it is the land of slumber, a burdensome darkness, the dwelling place of those who are there. Sleep is their occupation. They wake not to see their brothers. They cannot gaze upon their fathers and mothers. Their heart, hearts miss their wives and their children. The water of life, which is the nourishment of every mouth, it is thirst for me. It comes only to the one who is on earth. I thirst, though there's water beside me. I do not know the place where I am since I came to this valley. Give me flowing water. Say to me, may your form not be far from water. Turn my face to the north wind on the bank of the water. Surely my heart will be cooled in its grief. Death, come, is his name. Whoever he calls themselves, they come immediately though their hearts shudder in fear of him. No one sees him among gods and men. Great and small alike are in his hand. No one staves off his curse from the one he chooses. He steals the son from his mother rather than the old man that is drawing nigh to him. All the fearful are placed before him, but he turns not his face to them. He does not come to the one that prays to him. He does not heed the one who praises him. He is not seen, so no gift can be given to him. These skeptical and pessimistic voices may have been always there and may have found their expression in the heterotopoi of literature, the feast, and the lament even if it took much time to admit them into the canon of tomb inscriptions with their eternalizing aspirations. That this was possible, however, that the Egyptians were able to endure the tension between belief and disbelief and to give disbelief a voice even in the canon of tomb inscriptions is the best proof of the strength of their belief in immortality. The Egyptians seem to have, to have been by far the first to form a concept of immortality. Originally, it was a politically motivated concept connected with the institution of sacred king kingship, elevating Pharaoh to the rank of the immortal gods. But after the collapse of the old kingdom, it was extended to virtually all human beings. The immortality of the soul, however, was just one part of the Egyptian concept of immortality, linked to the bar, the judgment, and the illusion. The other part concerned the endless duration of the mummified corpse, resting in the monumental tomb in the earth. This double form of immortality is expressed in innumerable texts. For instance, may your bar exist living in Nehech, like Orion in the womb of the goddess of heaven, while your corpse may endure in jet, like the stone of the mountains. 
if Western Christianity has indeed inherited the Egyptian dream of immortality, it concerns only the first part, the ideas of soul, judgment, justification, and paradise. The preservation of the body is deemed much less important, and mummification remains the specificity of ancient Egypt. But ancient Egypt seems to have been the first civilization to dream the dream of immortality. Thank you all. Well, thank you for this very learned, uh, typical of yourself, learned lecture. Uh, I will try to be brief. Uh, I am an Iranist and lament the fact that Iran is little known clearly uh, among scholars uh, in general, apart from ir uh, Iranistics. My point is that I would say circa 1200 BCE, a poet priest named Zarathustra, whom we know as Zoroaster, let's call him that because of the Nietzschean confusion. Zoroaster, not necessarily the same as Zoroastrianism, which is a development uh, of only some of Zoroaster's ideas. My point here is that Zoroaster conceived of the soul uh, of the righteous, dualistically opposed to that of the wicked, uh, entering a unification in a sunny paradisiac place with the gods. This was uh, an important doctrine, a chief doctrine uh, of the poems of Zoroaster. And the residue uh, of that, even though it went through many changes, how would you assess this parallelism and how would you also assess the influence in the later phenomenon, the more westerly phenomenon of the Persian Empire under which the Jews lived and for which there are clear uh, eschatological influences from uh, Iran. How would you assess this in the balance with yeah. the learned presentation you gave concerning Egypt? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> this is a very important question. I think um, <clears throat> this is also a question of how to date the, these Iranian or Russian texts. Um, and if these texts are really <clears throat> um, uh, thus ancient uh, dating from the second millennium BCE, I think we are then confronted, we are dealing with two independent roots. Not one, ancient Egypt, but two roots of the idea of immortality, an Iranian and an Egyptian. And, uh, uh, ancient uh, Israel uh, had access to both. Of course, they met with uh, uh, Zoro Zoroastrianism in Babylon, and, and then they were ruled by Persia in the fifth and fourth uh, centuries. So uh, <clears throat> there were ample uh, occasion for being influenced by Zoroastrianism. But they were also ruled, of course, by Egypt in Ptolemaic times and in very early times, which I am not so sure whether there were, uh, there survived uh, substantial memories until, uh, until the composition of the biblical texts. But <clears throat> they were in contact with both influences, exposed to both influences. So, um, I see no difficulty in admitting Zoroastrianism as another um, uh, sphere where the idea of immortality uh, came up. Independent, of course, uh, if this belongs to, to the second millennium, I do not believe that there was an Egyptian influence on, on Iran. It's too far away. Um, uh, but we have see, uh, of course, we see uh, um, uh, later influences in, the, in this iconography of Ahura Mazda uh, and, of course, earlier of, of the god Asur. And so the, the iconographical influence of 
Egypt on Persia is quite evident, but of course at a much later period. I'll just add, for those who don't know, uh, ancient Iran is to the east, not where we have it in Persia yeah. today. Thank you, sir. We need to give your Even point. farther thank away. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Oh, hello, thank you so much for your stimulating question. I try to be very brief, and I have very two precise questions to ask you. First is, in terms of the ontological character of the soul of the king, which would ascend to the heavens, I'd be grateful if you could shed some light on it. Because as you know, the notion of psyche, in, for example, in Greece, yeah. in Plato, is not exactly your individualized, personalized soul, which you find in Christianity, and which I must, must add, following the gentleman who's just asked a question, could have not developed without an Iranian influence. The personalization of the soul is something for which the Iranian element plays an important role. So just what's the ontological status of the soul that ascends to heaven and joins the God? Is it the personal soul? That's my first question. Hmm. Second question is, since you made the connection between Mesopotamia and Egypt, if I could borrow a term from the late Jean-Pierre Vernon and use the term of ideology of death, desecrating an Egyptian tomb would, would obviously have grave consequences in religious terms, in ritual terms, just like it would have had in, in Mesopotamia. What exactly is the similarity of the manner in which mortal, common mortals would, would dwell, common, common mortals would dwell yeah. in, uh, in their tombs, because they wouldn't go into the, into the heavens, and the way in which, for example, the dead of Mesopotamia would be in their tomb. So what exactly, in terms of the ideology of, the, of death in Egypt and Mesopotamia, would be the situation of common men who can't ascend to the heavens, who cannot have any sort of privileged access to the heavens? So these are my two questions. The exact ontological nature of the soul, and then, of course, the manner in which common men would live in their tombs. And as you know, of course, in Mesopotamia, desecrating them was a huge, huge uh, mm. sin. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Difficult questions. Um, well, the ontological status. Um, Personalized soul, yeah. or is it something else? <laughs> yes, so I <clears throat> um, conceive of the Egyptian concept of Ba as the, um, the force that animates a body from within. So the, the, the spirit of life, or the, uh, <clears throat> uh, but closely related to the body, and uh, leaving the body uh, after death. So uh, <clears throat> uh, the ontological status of the soul before death is <clears throat> part of the person. A, a very important, spiritual, invisible, life-giving, animating part of the person. And the ontological status after death, well, <clears throat> uh, is uh, uh, still a part of the person, but now free to move in the realms of the universe and not no, no longer bound to the body. But the Egyptian idea and idea of death is that this is no definite separation. So the soul is able to freely move in, in heaven and underworld, but, <clears throat> um, but stays in contact with the corpse and visit the mummy every night. So by day, it is free to move around the world, and every night it enters the tomb and rests upon the mummy. And this is also the reason why uh, mummification and tomb building and uh, non-violation of the tomb is so essential for the Egyptians. Right? So the, uh, the Egyptian idea of surviving death is to what, what formerly, what in life was one unity of the person, is now a network of components, the bar and the car and the tomb and the uh, illusion. It is a network of communicating uh, elements. And um, the violation of the tomb would disturb this network. Yeah. Whereas in Mesopotamia, uh, there is, I think there's no idea of an illusion. This is, this is the land without return, and there's uh, no... Mm -hmm. So the, the violation of the 
Mesopotamian tomb is, is even, uh, even worse. more. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I genuinely enjoyed your presentation. Would you please give a little more detail about the concept of justice and its relationship to ma'at and maybe compare it and contrast it with what, we, what uh, appeared in Athens with Socrates and Plato, Dike and Dikaiosene yeah. in the process of justification. Do they look similar or different? Yeah, thank you. Well, the Egyptian concept of ma'at, ma'at is justice. But it's justice and truth. So Dike and Aletheia together. This is just one concept in Egypt like Asha in Persia, in Persian. Um, and um, so the Egyptians do not <laughs> distinguish between <clears throat> what is there and what should be. Yeah? This is the right. And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and this concept of ma'at, of justice, it, uh, means also um, uh, um, is also the foundation of permanence. So the unjust, the, uh, what does not correspond to justice is doomed to perish. And so this is the link between being, truth, and justice norm. And I think this uh, uh, is different from the Greek idea of DK. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello, thank you. Um, could you say something about the fate of non-human animals after death in ancient Egypt? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, even the animals were mummified in ancient Egypt and were <clears throat> subject of all these rituals of transfiguration. So even the animals had a soul uh, and um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the Egyptians were, uh, did not make a very strong distinction between animals and men, even animals and gods. There were these sacred animals and these huge cemeteries of mummified animals that were, in a way, sacred, even, even uh, manifestations of the divine in the animals. animals. So, um, <clears throat> Um, yeah. This. Hi. When I was studying in Egypt, some Egyptian uh, scholars were talking about the relationship between Could the three pyramids a, 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 in not, Giza. Not so fast. Okay. <laughs> the three pyramids in Giza with the position of the stars. Yeah. And for example, in the constellation of the Belt of Orion. Yeah, this is a theory which is that I do true? not subscribe to. Okay, but I was wondering, <laughs> is there a relation between... Uh, the building of tombs and stars in any way? Because I know on some days there's, you know, one day a year light comes into a yeah, certain tomb. Yeah, it, were yeah. they very interested in yeah. astronomy? And if yeah. you could talk about that. Well, yes, there's one temple where this seems to play a role, the temple of Abu Zimbel, where at a certain time the uh, rays of the sun uh, hit the statues at the back. Yeah, the, this does not refer to tombs but to the temple of Abu Zimbel. And um, the tombs are, I think, they, <clears throat> um, they are not also the pyramids. Uh, the pyramids, of course, are oriented uh, to the cardinal points. And there is always an opening to the north uh, where the bar of the king can fly up to the polar star. But, uh, but the pattern of the pyramids on Earth I think this is coincidence that this has something to do with it. <laughs> thank you for your questions. Thank you for this magnificent lecture. And let's thank uh, Professor Osman one more time.